Any, uh, okay, here's a question. Oh, but you asked one already, so I need to ask the gentleman okay. next to you. Sorry. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a huge fan of biking, huge fan of bike share. Uh, I've got plenty of frustration with the city bike, bike system here. But how, how does it make sense to have a model where bikes are thrown a thousand at a time on a street corner, and whether it's Beijing or uh, New York or anywhere in between, or the, the opposite of that is how does it make sense to have a bike hidden, a low and sold bike hidden, either by a rider or by a competing company down the back alley that no one can find. Like, how, how does that work? How do you, there are literally thousands of bikes on any given street corner by a subway station. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep my answer short, and please stop me if, I, if it takes too long. Um, the first one, I think, looking back at your question, you use the verb throw, which is not what we do. So since April 22nd, 2016, when they started to roll out the solution, it wasn't only about the bikes. The bikes is the tip of the iceberg, and it's everything that you can read about in the news and you can see on the streets, because it's what's visible, right? But it's only a third. We also have the whole data management platform, and we have some kind of smart parking that we also proactively roll out. Uh, so the data, we generate over 30 terabytes of data daily, because all 8 million bikes have a GPS. And so much of the artificial intelligence and the data mining happens in that part, which is definitely the hidden part of the iceberg. And then the smart parking is also something that we uh, push out proactively. So again, in June 2016, when I was the first and the only foreigner in the company, we went and talked to the government, to the private partners, telling them, look, we've got this bike. We'll also help you to convince your local council to roll out more parking space. So there's a big part of education and PR that we need to do in order to present the solution as a whole. Because if you read articles, you can only see the bikes, but it doesn't talk about all the thought and energy and time and investment that goes into providing more than the bikes. And then for the second part of your question is leveraging technology. So because all the bikes have a GPS, if somebody takes it home, we know about it. Uh, we and our operations team can go and retrieve that bike. Another user can be incentivized to go and retrieve that bike for us. Uh, the police force can also help us. So when we launched in Manchester, representatives from uh, local law enforcement were, were there as well. And now in Manchester, if you break the law on a mobile, like the police is actually able to stop you while you're riding, which was not possible at first because we didn't have this, this agreement with them. But now we don't even need to be there. The police can help us operate mobile. So that is how we prevent things like this from happening. So that, that's another side of the coin if you're talking about the regulations on bike sharing where the actual police can help you um, to run the operations right. more smoothly. Uh, I want to ask how many, you said you're in 12 markets already, and then how many cities are you in in the US? So far we're only operating in Washington DC and that's okay. been running since <laughs> August. Okay. Washington DC seems to be a very bike friendly market. What about Seattle? Are they going to go? I see Seattle is kind of another one of these. Boston, no? So, so you've been to Seattle, right? Mm -hmm. There are hills. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so the city of Seattle launched their bike sharing program, and the mobile guys asked me, you know, can, can we introduce this like a year and a half ago? So we made a conversation, and what was funny is every morning, You'd see the city, and they go the truck. They go down, and they have these huge trucks. They take all the bikes up to the top of the hill, and they park the bikes. And at the afternoon, so people would ride the bikes down the hill. And then, and then, so, so it, it's a it's a great idea. But but the problem in Seattle is that you have a lot of narrow streets, but it really is hilly. And these bikes these bikes are really not optimized for climbing seven degree hills. They're not Tour de France vehicles, right? So there are a couple of things I have to answer. The, the, the bike you're mentioning is not the latest version. Very simple thing, the latest version has three gears, so that helps. Um, as of today, we have the technology in the app to incentivize people. So, for example, if you ride the bike from a, a, a valley area to the top of a hill area, you can get rewarded for that. And we've seen this behavior happen in China already. People on Sunday afternoon, instead of going to the movies with their friends, they go mobile hunting. And I'm not, this is the truth. Like, we call them mobile hunters. And it's not, it's not something we started. It's like a social movement that kind of grew out of nowhere. And people just get together and find those bikes that are hidden in, in some alley somewhere. Wow. Uh, and I have a third point. Oh, yeah. I love that. That's cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Uh, I, I see a hand in the back from uh, Dorinda Elliott. Hi. Yeah. 
Um, so these days, I mean, we've, we've seen um, consumers in China going from absolute delight, as you described, of being able to ride these bikes and, and being so thrilled by that, to I just got back from China and the sort of scuttlebutt or the chit chat about the mobile, the, about bike, bike sharing phenomenon was, oh my God, what a colossal waste of of resources. The stories that have been coming out recently, of course, are kind of mountains of discarded bikes and stuff. Yeah. So I wonder, do you feel like you have been kind of tarnished by other bike companies that have come into the business? There's this glut underway. So can you talk about that a little bit? Well, again, pun intended, it's hard not to get piled up with the, with the other colors. Um, I think being proactive and talking to the commercial partners as well as the government is going to be a very big differentiator. When you look at the bike itself, the fact that our lifetime is four years, whereas competitors maybe it's three months, uh, that's, that's a huge difference. Those pictures that we see, they never tell the whole story. So it's one thing to see it and then be shocked by it, but when you dig a little bit deeper and you go above the headline, which is purposefully uh, uh, punchy, then you learn more about actually what happened and what our company tries to do to prevent some, some such events from happening. Um, so it's a, it's a constant education and, and, and PR work that we do. So the other, the other key thing is the only people that are hurt by the bikes, the wasted capital in the bikes that aren't used and things, are the venture capital community. <laughs> Seriously, these are all privately funded companies. And so if these were all, if the cities were spending taxes for dollars in the US, or the equivalent in China to go out and throw these, throw this uh, inventory out on the streets, then number one, it wouldn't be nearly as thoughtfully done as what Mobike and, and, and some of the better ones are doing. And then you'd have a real reason to worry about the capital, the, the waste of money. But right now, the only people that are being hurt are investors that are trying to profit off this. So the sympathy level for VC <laughs> is pretty low. <laughs> What's your work like, like at Mobike? Are you working, you know, you're in these terms, you know, what is it, six days a week, 12 hours a day or more? Uh, is that your work life as well? It's pretty no, crazy. No, no time off because you're in this high growth trying to start up? It's, it's, it's honestly pretty crazy. Um, you know, there's the, the 9 to 5 in the Western world, and then there's the, what do you call it, 9 Nine six, which is six days away, and nine to nine, or whatever. Yeah. Uh, that's just like that. And then if you don't want to do that, then you know nobody's gonna gonna tell you do that. But stuff's gonna happen. You don't have to sleep at the office. I'm happy to sleep at the office, but that's the thing. Like, like if you're really passionate about it, it, it doesn't matter. And working on Sunday afternoon or whatever, it, it doesn't matter. And I hope that everyone who's actually an entrepreneur and who does something on their own feels like that. It doesn't feel like a job, it feels like a life mission or a calling or whatever you want to call it. But if you don't wake up in the morning and you're happy to do what right. you do, then that, it's not the right thing, right? Absolutely. So you mentioned sleeping at the office the first time I did it. I was ecstatic, which is fun. <laughs> Pull out a couch and step next to the computer. I wouldn't do that every day, but it's just fun. How, how many days a week do you do that? No, rarely, not. because I travel so much. But uh, I do it sometimes. I do it sometimes. Ter terminal 2 in Beijing Airport. Oh, okay, any question about mobile? before we move into our blockchain segment part of it. Oh my goodness, so many hands. Uh, Peter Crosby in the back. Hey, Close hi. Box. Hi, Gary. Hi, <laughs> Rebecca. Um, uh, two, one is a, as a Mo biker, o forward and city biker. Um, who wants my data? Who pays for the data of where I'm driving? Right? So you, you obviously have terabytes of data. Who, who buys that? Second question is, who's making your bikes? I'll start with the second one. Um, we actually started out by providing the design to a third party, so they would manufacture for us, and the team quickly realized that that wasn't gonna work. So a typical Chinese style, they bought the factory, <laughs> and that team became our bike team. So in the first part, we were manufacturing all of our bikes. Now we still manufacture our bikes, but we also work with other third parties. Foxconn is a strategic investor, and also our manufacturing partner in China. So, long story short, we manufacture the bikes. And for the first question, I'm not a, a back-end architecture specialist, but to my knowledge, the data is always owned by the user. Then it's stored 
on a, on a server that's either <laughs> or a third party as well. Internationally, we work with Microsoft. Um, so the data is owned by the user. And within mobile, we only leverage those data insights to increase operational efficiency. That's the only thing we do with it. I, I think one thing, with the first question, I think he was asking, so who, to monitor, in monetization of the platform, who's going to be paying for the data? So you, you can imagine the, like, right. Mae Kwan Dien paying Yelp, open table. If they knew that you were writing by, if, uh, yeah. Amazon, if Amazon knew you were near a Whole Foods, oh, yeah. and they could get, I mean, no, this, this GPS data is going to be incredibly valuable. Again, not about advertising anymore. It's about how do you get transactions. Yep. And the GPS data is really important for driving transactions. Good. Uh, yes. Just talking Chelsea, about, right? Yeah, Chelsea. Talking about data, one hurdle some companies are having, such as DJI, and potentially mobile, because a lot of American customers and other countries find the idea of their data going to China kind of unnerving. Um, and sometimes it's grounded and sometimes it's not, but what are some, you know, I come from a comms background, what are some strategies to kind of, you know, make them feel better about that idea? The data, if the data needs to be hosted locally, then it's hosted locally. It's my understanding that in Germany, for example, it's quite strict. They have whatever rules and regulation, we abide by that. And so if a German person, I guess the same in the US, if, if someone says, you know, I don't want my, my data to lead to China, or flee to China, then that's just not the case. So then maybe it's more of a background educational, you know, like, are you willing to enjoy Chinese services or products? But then that's more of a, it's not a purely data-facing question, right? Okay, up here. Let me, let me think more of a Gary, but let me try and fine tune that question a little bit. Um, the U.S. and China have very different data privacy issues, situations and setups and so on. I'm not quite sure who has my data and worries me, but you've both done and seen both. How do you compare and contrast and kind of the privacy of personal data like this in China and the U.S. and the pros and cons? It's a big question, but mm -hmm. I'm curious what your thoughts on that. So the cheeky response is in the U.S. there's the appearance of privacy, and in China there is no appearance. I mean, I, am, I actually a few years ago took the effort to figure out who knew what about me, and I had a couple friends say, one of some of their kids who were really, really good, they said, well, what can you find out? In about 15 minutes, Visa card numbers, addresses, and in China, people don't even think about it. It's, they, there is not the expectation of privacy that we have here. Okay, let's, uh, okay, uh, just one. Is it, a, is it a question related to mobile? Or is it a question of origin? Okay, then let's bring up Shunan Chen uh, from Agile VC. She's here from Silicon Valley. And uh, she knows a lot about blockchain and uh, frontier technologies. 